So at Nafu, Sarah is going first. Uh, and then if Suman's not there, you'd be next. Is that okay? Yes, okay, okay, fine. Yeah, it's okay for me, Dr. Alok. Thank you. I'll, I will stop sharing. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. Sarah, you carry on. I was okay. going to say, Atnafu can present after you. Absolutely fine. Okay. <laughs> so you can go full screen and you can start. Okay. So, so uh, I'm going to present a, a case. It's a term baby, was born with uh, an outborn. And uh, he was born by C-section because of the bridge presentation. And after birth, he developed uh, a respiratory stress with uh, hypoxemia and he was intubated and uh, ventilated and he received uh, one dose of surfactant. And then he was transported to our NICU. And uh, when he arrived, he was more or less uh, six hours. And uh, I did the, the ultrasound, he was ventilated and uh, his uh, FIO2 was a point, uh, whole point uh, 40. And Oh my God, where are the next slide? Yeah. And so this is R1 and the R2. And uh, in the R1 image, we can see the pleural line uh, that is regular and sharp. And I think there is uh, some micro consolidations in the left part of the scan. And uh, I was in doubt because in the bottom, in the left side of the screen, I, I, I was uh, in doubt if uh, it, it, this is a, a consolidation. Consolidation, deep consolidation. Yeah. It's a little bit tricky to say at this point uh, yeah. because what, and classically what uh, you'd see in that right side is just sometimes thymus coming in. And really, you'd need to have a look above. And it, it, this is a really nice example for everybody. So uh, what often happens is when we do the R1 region, we miss the apex where you'd see the thymus. Yeah. So it's just when you see something like that, going a little bit higher, just to try and see if you can get the thymus as well. My gut feeling is you have thymus just above. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether that is a deep consolidation. I agree. I, you know, that I'd be very suspicious at this stage. Uh, the reason I'm also suspicious is you can just see some dynamic bronchograms. Can you see how they move in and out? Uh, those are, I, oh, so sorry. if you just focus on that region. Again, yeah. yeah with was, your, I'm trying to, to, to have the pointer. Sorry. No problems. That's all right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So just if you come down there, 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 there. there. Yeah. So you, can you see how the bronchogram moves in and up and down? I just wonder whether that's a dynamic bronchogram. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. would be very interested in your baby's CRP, but let's go through your images. Yeah. Yeah. So in this image, I can, I can classify it like a AB profile because we see A, a lines and uh, some uh, B lines that are compact B lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Yep. The A lines are, are there. Okay. Yep. So Absolutely. in the, yeah, in the R2 image, I can see the the, the bad sign and the, and the plural line also, uh, and uh, some high lines and the B lines. Uh, so I think it's much the same. Yep, I agree. So okay. just just to say that in the R two image, that slight discontinuity that you see in the plura, yeah, is not discontinuity. It's actually continuous. It's just when the baby kind of uh, inspires right. yeah yeah you see you probably have a slight loss of contact yes. at that point but yeah, yeah. so very yeah. nice images okay. in r1 just mm -hmm. before we move on yeah. there's a small area or where the plural looks a little bit discontinuous with a subplural micro yeah, consolidation right like here. you said yep so <laughs> yep that's something to keep in mind yep yeah and you do have a few more micro consolidations with some comet tails in between but yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we move on and 
this is my heart free uh, image and uh, here yeah like i say here i i think I, i'm in doubt if the 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 plural line is irregular or i think it's more the the malposition of the probe and loss of contact um, but yep. I, I really i would agree uh, and i area, just yeah. wonder whether you have a little bit of mirror imaging coming there with the rib as well Mm -hmm. But yeah, you've probably lost contact, which is why your pleura looks irregular. But classically, uh, a B profile as you move down into the axilla. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, what I'd say is that you just, with the eye of faith, might have a small effusion there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here. So, yep. Yes. So, very nice images. B profile with an effusion. And again, mm -hmm. the you have consolidations there visible so if you just want to go below the rib can you see it yeah. come in yes my pointer is yeah okay yeah perfect uh there right. yeah. and just to the right of it just yeah. coming in yeah. yeah that's it coming in and out okay yeah. yeah okay so did this baby have any meconium nope no okay no meconium he he, he, um, he, he was born uh, and he cried, but then after one minute or so, he, he was uh, with much effort breathing and uh, uh, needed uh, some support because he was uh, um, with irregular respiratory effort and uh, bradypnea and apnea. Yeah. And no skin staining, nail staining, nothing to no. suggest. No, that's fine. No, yeah. no. Uh, but but th this pregnancy was not uh, su su had not surveillance. Yeah. And uh, we don't know much of the about the pregnancy and of, yeah, yeah yeah. But okay. uh, he, he, the the checkup, uh, the um, PCR was negative, and uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. We don't know the SGB um status of the mother yep so in the left part of the lung we have Beautiful. here very nice image yeah we have here the the pleural line i think it's regular and sharp and we see here the 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 heart of course and the the the, the lung is sliding and we have the uh, some i think we we see here some hay lines and uh, some b lines so I would call it like a, a navy profile. Yep. So would you like to show us the thymus as well? The thymus, yeah, here. Yep. So you've got the thymus there and you've got yeah, some yeah, comet, yeah. Yeah. comet tails coming in just there, mm -hmm. uh, but with bee lines to the, yeah, to the okay. left. And yeah, so I would agree, kind of an AB profile. You know, the mm -hmm. question I would ask is whether you might have a double lung point. So my only critique over here is uh, your, your probe at the moment, uh, you're using an eight hertz uh, mm -hmm. for a term baby, which is not bad. Uh, you should get full depth. You're about four centimeters. We're kind of losing the slightly deeper regions. Yes. Uh, again, with an I eight hertz, to... yeah, with an eight hertz probe, you should get the deeper regions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you might just want to do is turn your gain settings up a little bit. Up. Yeah. yeah. Which machine are you using? Uh, it's a, a Siemens one. It's a Siemens, which is an, yeah. it's a very nice machine. Does it have sharp mode by any chance? No. It doesn't have. No problems. <laughs> I did that's check okay. and no, yeah. That's fine. No, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. So in the L2 region, we have the, the plural line that is sharp and is sliding. We have hay lines and some B lines. And yeah, the, the depth. Uh, I, I lose the image in the deeper parts. Yep, not a problem. So, yeah. uh, so what would you call that? So that is an AB profile. But AB uh, profile, yeah. Anything else you'd like to coin that? You've got good sliding everywhere. Yeah. So that's a double lung point. A double, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. double lung point. So, and uh, I think a very nice one. Again, upper region well aerated, lower region mm -hmm. slightly less well aerated. Yeah. Just on the right side, it's just difficult for me to say, just there, yeah. it's very difficult for me to say mm -hmm. whether you've got an area of subplural atelectasis with what yeah. you'd sometimes think of shred sign. So again, if, and it might be that you've lost contact because you've yeah. also got a rib at the top and that might be a rib shadow that you see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 
you know, it's difficult to say, but again, what I'd say is that you, the focus at this particular point is at the right place, as yes, I can see on your cool. margins. So you get very yeah. good plural. I think if you want to see deeper regions, you can sometimes drop your focus down a focus little bit. Focus down. Yeah. yeah. If, because you've got the right depth. And I mean, for me, you've got the right frequency for a term, maybe. So mm-hmm. nice images, enough for me to definitely make an interpretation. And my compliments for getting the heart on the left side. Often these babies mm-hmm. with lung disease are quite hyperinflated. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you've got a lung pulse there. I think what we just have to be careful of in L1 is just the pleura next to the heart. And I mean, I, with the eye of faith, I can see B lines. <laughs> so I can see sliding throughout. But there are some subplural micro consolidations there. Yeah. Well done. Yep. Carry okay. on. Yeah, and uh, in the L3 region, yeah, the plural line is regular, and we see lung sliding. And uh, here, I would call it a B profile because we have compact B lines here, yep. and we hardly see the A line yep. probably here. But yeah, yeah, and that's yep. it. And the next image, I. Uh, yep. did go uh, imperially just a yep. bit and I can see here beautiful. the, the pleural effusion yeah, yeah, and beautiful. the curtain sign yeah. right. a beautiful curtain sign uh, you know I I wouldn't be able to do that better myself uh, you can see the 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 spleen coming underneath with mm-hmm. the, yeah. a little bit of fluid collection in the abdomen as well but that's a pleural effusion yes here signs. right yep yep yeah that's beautiful. So at the moment, uh, just keen to get a few more details. So what was your CRP on admission? Negative. And we, yep. you, we repeat it. The, the baby started on antibiotics uh, after birth in the, the hospital it was born. Mm. And, uh, but the, the, and the CRPs are, are negative and the, the culture, the blood culture is uh, negative. And no rupture of membranes to the best of your knowledge? No. No, no, yeah. I mean, I. what do you think? What is your clinical feel? What diagnosis are you coming to at this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's have a look. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. just I, I did the, the M mode to, to see if I, I could have the, the sinusoidal, sinusoidal sign <laughs> here. Uh, and I don't really know if, if, if I... This is, I can call it the, uh, I don't know. In, in parts, in parts, mm-hmm. what I'd say is because you've got the spleen there and yeah. it's such a small effusion, you're not getting a very typical sinusoidal sign. Yeah. So it's a small it's a, one. Yeah. yeah, it's a good try. It's a really good try, I think. <laughs> yeah, well done. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I thought that I could call it an RDS. I, I I try to 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 think in TTN, but we have some subplural consolidation, so it's not so so typical. Uh, and this baby was um, this is uh, this scan is uh, four hours after the, the surfactant, and so I call it the uh, an RDS with a, a consolidation on the right lung. Uh, I was I was in doubt with yep. some. So, what was the mode of delivery? Uh, C-section. It's elective. Was the mother in labor? Uh, yes, she, he, was, she in was in labor. Yeah, and it was a, a bridge uh, presentation. So okay, so I'm just curious. I mean, this is a really tricky one because mm-hmm. one of the questions that comes to mind is it doesn't have subplural consolidations everywhere. Yeah, it does have. Uh, I would say some elements of consolidation. Now, one of our challenges at this particular point is the baby's been given surfactant quite early on. And sometimes when you give surfactant to these babies, you can have areas of consolidation because of lack of aeration of the lungs. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the kind of baby where what I would do is I would do serial lung ultrasound and follow the course up clinically. And that would be a major way of me trying to make a, a retrospective diagnosis using lung ultrasound. I'd have to agree, it's not very typical of uh, severe or established RDS because you don't have subplural consolidations or the snowflake sign 
mm-hmm. or consolidations in all regions. You have micro consolidations in certain regions and maybe one area of deep consolidation. And it would be a little bit tricky for me to give it a pure label of RDS at this point, but you have a lot of double lung points at four hours of age with pleura that looks relatively smooth, uh, maybe a little bit blurred at places. So I, I would like to take the history into account and say, I might hedge my bets and say, actually, this could be a, a, a little bit of TT and you've given us a factor into this baby. Yeah. The question is, if I do a serial ultrasound in about four hours, and I see the clinical course, established RDS in a baby like this is not going to get better. The other thing that comes to mind is, uh, you it know- It did better. It did better and, and was extubated. And the next presentation is the, of the same ba- baby. Uh, okay, 20. go for it. Let's, let's have a look at that. Yeah, let's have a look oh, at that. okay. <laughs> yeah, let's have a look at that. So yeah, what yeah. we'll do is we'll go through those slides reasonably uh-huh. quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. was extubated and then- uh, two hours after, after extubation, he, he did he, he did badly with respiratory distress and his mm. uh, uh, FiO two uh, worst to hope on forty. And uh, okay. this is oh okay yeah, and this is the the pleural line that is regular and, and sharp and lung sliding is absent in the yep. right part of the image. So. Yep. And we can see the truck sign, and this is an A dash profile with yep. the lung point there. Yep. And uh, this is R1, and uh, this is R2. Yeah, very nice, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, we can see all, all the things of the. Yep. You can see a lung point beautifully. Yeah. Uh, you can see the barcode sign. Yeah, uh, we can see here the B lines, yep. but we yep. don't see the. The plural line, yeah, the barcode sign, and uh, this is uh, R3, yeah, again, because I was excited and uh, I did. Yep, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. <laughs> the barcode yeah. sign is much better visible. Obviously, yeah. you've got a, a collection that extends all the way across. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see uh, very, uh, I would say, nice uh, lung point there, I suspect. You're using a linear probe or a hockey stick? A linear one. A linear one, yeah. Okay, yeah. very nice. Yeah, carry yeah. on. Yeah. And in the in the yeah, this is the same. Yeah. Yeah, and this was yeah this X-ray in the uh, at this time with yep. the 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 pneumothorax here. Yeah. Yep. So you can see it. Yeah. Do we have any of the initial X-rays by any chance? Uh, no. We don't. No. Okay. I, I couldn't have it. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's not a problem. So yeah. you've got a little bit of fluid in the fissure there that you can okay. see. Uh, mm-hmm. You've definitely got collapsed lung. Yeah. So again, the question from my perspective is, I mean, how did the baby manage? Did you have to do anything clinically for that or did? No, we we waited and uh, uh, 24 hours after he, he was doing well and the FIO2 needed it was a whole point for 25 and mm. clinically it was uh, more stable. Yeah, Lovely. we didn't uh, need all aspirated or sure. not. Amazing. Uh, that's a beautiful scan. My compliments. That's, that's a really nice scan. Well done. Thank uh, you. What do others think? So I'm just curious to put it out to the group guys. Uh, People, TTN versus RDS, I mean, bad TTN versus possible RDS. I'm just curious. What do we think, guys? Show of hands. Anybody, you can come do it in the comments box. Mohammed, do you have a question? Uh, no, no, you, I think you, you, I got the answer because on L1, I saw some subplural consolidation before, but you said mm-hmm. it. Okay, so we've got, we've got, okay, now, now the bets started. So we've, we're putting odds on this. So Doris says RDS, Anna says bad TTN. Okay, Sharif kind of feels this more RDS because of the consolidations. <laughs> Anybody else, guys? Come on. Sujit is RDS. Mm. 
Margarita's TTN. Yeah, Mayank feels it's MAS, but no history. And I, I, I think Mayank, uh, Mayank's thoughts, I mean, I think if you've had in utero aspiration, uh, it could be the case, uh, but we don't have any history. Experiences yes. in utero aspiration usually have nail staining, cord staining, but yeah, it would fit into MAS, mm -hmm. but we've got TTN. So we've got a mix of features here. I think the beauty of this is, my only comment is fluid in the fissure, again, slightly favors TTN, clinical course, again, but you have had surfactant. So a 50-50 kind of a mix, again, if I think of the incidence of RDS in established labor, it would be less. So either of you could be right, but I think I'd I'd probably go with really bad TTN in this case, yeah, based probably. on the, the clinical profile and presentation. So lovely, that's really good. Uh, so we, uh, Atnafu, would you like to go next? And then Suman, you can go after the, uh, Dr. Atnafu. Sure, sure. Atnafu, you happy to share? Thank you very much. I'm really grateful. Can you see my screen? I can, sir. Thank you. Okay. So I will be presenting two cases, uh, term babies. The first is a 39 weeks uh, gestational age baby who didn't have, a mother didn't have antenatal care follow-up and delivery was at the nearby clinic through via BS ASPD. Baby was referred to hospital after Meningomyelosis was detected just after delivery. There was no antenatal care follow-up, and because of that, that, that region was not detected. And the baby had mild retraction at presentation to the hospital, but it, it was able to maintain saturations with intranasal intra oxygen, and baby was sent to my echo lab. Uh, remember, the baby was admitted to another hospital where I am not working. And the baby referred to me for to my echo lab as pre op assessment for before surgery was done for meningomyelosis repair and lung ultrasound and echo was done on the fifth day of uh, the postnatal age. So, uh, I'm sorry, just yeah, that's all right. Sorry. So, th this is uh, L1. Uh, as you can see, there is a small uh, lung sliding and pleura regular and uh, few P lines, there are A lines. And this is same in R1. Yep. Small pleura line sliding, lung sliding and few P lines. Otherwise, there is A lines, there are A lines. So these are the same find, the lung ultrasound finding is the same in other lung zones as well. But what made me to present this case for this training is this, 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 this one. So this is echo actually, a little bit different. And this is a parasternal long axis view, a little bit off axis of the long axis. And as you can see, this is aorta and this ascending aorta with aortic valve. This is left atrium, very small. And here is a mitral valve, if you can see it. This one, it's opening and closing. And this is another big mass seen in the left hilum. Yeah. So it has compressed the left atrium. This is a left atrium. It has compressed it. And actually there is no obstruction. I have tried to check with echo, whether there is obstruction to the pulmonary veins and to the mitral valve, there is no obstruction. And so it is large, cystic, yeah. well delineated, well circumscribed mass in the left uh, hilum. And this is the measurement, as you can see, orthogonal measurement, 28 by 27 millimeter size of cystic mass in the left thorax. And I just, Report concluded my echo 
there is no structural abnormality of the heart, but there is large cystic mass in the left hilum compressing the left atrium with no obstruction to the mitral valve and pulmonary venous uh, drainage. And I recommended the treating physicians to have either chest X-ray or possibly better CT scan. CT scan, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, I tried to have a follow-up whether they have done CT scan or not. They told me they have done CT scan and they got the same finding. Okay. But there was large cystic mass. I couldn't get the CT image because it was in another hospital. Large cystic mass in the left thorax and possibly cystic adenomatoid mass of the left lung. Can so we have a look at your first uh, images, uh, Dr. Tnafu? I'd be grateful. Okay, so, this one? So, yeah. So can I just ask which machine and which probe? Uh, this is a different machine. It is a linear probe and the yeah. Siemens. Siemens. It's a linear probe. And what frequency are we using? 9 to 12. We're using a frequency of 9 to 12. So yeah. one of the things is your gain settings are on the lower side. Uh -huh. might need slightly higher gain settings because it's very okay. difficult to see the A-lines. Yeah, sure. The probe is a little bit older. That's, uh, I agree. I get That's it. I quality get, yeah. is not as such good. I, I, and uh, it's a linear probe? Yeah, that it's a using? linear probe. Yeah. yeah, it's a linear probe. So that is obviously you're working within those challenges. So I, I apologize. I think the, I mean, the one thing I'd say is your, your, your marker is at the plural line, the plural margin. I can see good sliding. Mm -hmm. uh, what you might do is you can drop the frequency to eight to see if you get a little bit more delineation from the deeper part of the lung. Okay. And the other thing is if you want to get slightly better quality, I mean, like to get better A lines, because I know that you're looking for two, three, four, mm. five mm. centimeters of depth. You can mm. reduce your depth a little bit to try and see the superficial areas of the lung a little bit better and then mm. increase the depth and use a slightly lower frequency. And okay. it's worth having a play with those settings and just increasing your gain settings next time. Mm. And what would be nice to see is, so kind of if you save this image in your logbook, uh, then what, mm. what, what I'd really like to see is whether we can improve the quality of your image by just playing around with your settings. So my feedback would be, let's try a lower setting in the term baby next time come down to eight, reduce your depth to try and get the superficial areas. So you can use a higher frequency if that's the case. But when you're looking at the deeper areas, we use a lower frequency of eight at this depth to try and see if we can get the deeper areas. Your contact you, is definitely uh, fine because the ribs are completely, uh, I would say in unison, the plura is, mm. is completely continuous with good sliding. So the superficial areas of the lung I can delineate, uh, but I think the blurred nature of the, the image is probably because your probe is on the older side and it's whether we can play a little bit with the, the settings to try and see. The other thing is, again, uh, just having a look on, uh, do, do you have a, a total gain, time gain compensation on the, the probe? Yeah, yeah, for this so, one I have. Yeah, machine again, gain. just to try and see if you can increase the gain compensation in these areas because uh, I, th I think you have decent gain settings in the, superficial part definitely can be better. Uh, but the question is whether we might be able to induce gain settings in the lower half of the image. So Thanks. just a little bit of playing with that, but yeah, well done and a good diagnosis for you to pick up. My compliments. Thank you. So these are my conclusion is lung ulcers on finding. And second one is uh, 40 weeks gestational age. Yeah delivered through spontaneous vaginal delivery. <clears throat> Never started, lasted for seven hours. The baby developed respiratory distress just after delivery. And there was meconium stained amniotic fluid on the skin and on the nails as well. And the baby intubated and put on mechanical ventilator with his um, board just after delivery. CPTR repeated at 12 hours post delivery was not raised and ultrasound was done at age of uh, 36 hours postnatal age. And this is the X-ray of the baby. And it's a little bit actually poor quality, but you can see there is haziness around here. Yeah, upper lobe, definitely. Mm. Yeah, very nice actually. I, uh, you know, uh, that's very well delineated. So, yep. Mm. So this is a uh, lung ultrasound. This machine is a GE machine actually. It's a different hospital. Yep. So this is L1 G machine linear probe. 
I agree. I, I didn't keep the focus on appropriate place. Uh, not to Just worry. I noticed this yeah, uh, after I finished the scanning. Sorry for that. That's Otherwise, you can see compact B lines and yep. uh, thick plural line with some irregularity, but sliding. And this is L3. Uh, this is a term baby. I tried to use a 12 uh, region of classification. So this is L3. Plural is sliding, thickened, but broken. And so we're still on one. L1. We're still no, on this L1. is L3. This, this is, is L3. L3. Okay, my yeah. apologies. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. This is L3. Sliding yeah. plural. Yeah, yeah. Thickened, classical. Broken. Very classical. Yeah. With subplural consolidation. Yeah. Classic. These areas. Yeah. These areas. And this one is L5. Yeah. More consolidation, Oof. more irregularity of the plural with. Yep compact B lines and yep. maybe shred side. Yep. 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 And this one is R1. Straight plural, no irregularity, sliding, but there are B lines. And actually at here consolidation. Subplural consolidation, yes. Yeah, Very nice. Sorry, yep. with, with broken plural and subplural plural consolidation. Yep. And here, R3, yeah, still the same, yep. with consolidation, sliding plural, but broken in some places, and the diffuse or compact B lines, and more consolidation in R5, more than any of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so... So again, just my comment with R5 at the moment is uh, mm. obviously the back of the baby is always quite thick. Uh, mm. You have skin, you've got muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, and the challenge, obviously, from our perspective is getting the alignment. So we've got uh, basically a lot of rib shadow coming in. But even with that, what I can say is you've got very nice irregular plural line, compact B lines with subplural consolidations, areas of subplural atelectasis, uh, you know, not really. Uh, uh, so there's this shred sign in the previous images. I mean, I think the beauty of this is to highlight to my colleagues again, when you look at that x-ray in the first instance, you don't really think about established meconium aspiration with the history. But I think once you see the lung ultrasound, uh, you can clearly, you know, clinically correlate. And remember, this is a baby whose CRP is normal. At what age was this, Dr. Ethnafu? Sir, six hours. Yep. Six hours. So, hours. So six hours. 36 hours. And the yeah. CRP had not gone up. Yeah. Actually, CRP was done at the age of 12 hours post delivery. It okay. was not elevated at that time. Okay. Would be interesting to see what the CRP is at this point. And yeah. I mean, how, how has the baby behaved since then? In distress, still requiring high ventilator setting mm -hmm. and uh, SIMB mode, FIO2 of uh, 60 and rate of. Uh, 30, I think, if I'm not mistaken, but still a little bit on the higher range of sure. ventilator setting. So Margarita's uh, asked a beautiful question. May we use the term snowflake sign in any of these images? I think Dr. Liu mm -hmm. might get upset. Personally, I'd have no problems, but unfortunately, uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Liu, who've described this terminology, have kind of described it in relation to describing the severity of RDS from grade one to grade four. So I'd probably restrict it to that. Uh, I would probably say that you have a lot of subplural consolidation, predominantly with mm. broken pleura, atelectasis. And again, I, this is another point I want to highlight to everybody. The presence of shred sign in isolation could be a marker of infection, but I have seen shred sign with severe PIE and with bad meconium aspiration. And I've seen shred sign in those situations with normal CRPs. And the reason I want to highlight this is my clinical feeling is there are a lot of babies Hello? who have in utero aspiration. And when they have in utero as aspiration, they develop Hello? established chemical changes. Sorry, Dr. Atnafu, can you hear us? Uh, guys, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello. Okay. Yeah. So what I'd say is that some of these babies will have chronic changes with meconium aspiration. And really in those situations, you can get shred sign. I would probably avoid the snowflake terminology for this setting. I try to keep it for the grades of RDS. 
Any questions? So I've got Doris who's raised yes. her hand. Yeah. Yes, well, look, I was going to ask, how do you differentiate atelectasis from consolidation? Because you mentioned yep. atelectasis and consolidation. Can I cover it in the next class? Is that okay, okay. Doris? I'll, because we will have a very detailed session on it on okay. Thursday, and I will be covering it so that you guys have a good feel. The main giveaway for me is when the Prudal line is not visible at all. If the Prudal line is not visible at all, for me, it's more likely you have atelectasis because you're not having aeration. But let, let's let's cover it in the next class. It's a beautiful question. Uh, Sharif, was that you? Did you have a question? No, no, no. But Did I just, I, uh, maybe I missed uh, uh, what terminology you said uh, we need to avoid. So, uh, Ma Margarita has asked, so, when Atnafu showed you the scans, you had a lot of subplural consolidations, especially in the R3 image, and it's uniform in the subplural region. And that has also been described as an alveologram. But uh, when, when, when the classification for severity of RDS, and I, we will have a look at it again, don't worry, we'll be revising in our consolidation phases. There's a classification which grades RDS based on X-ray appearances. Dr. Wang uh, and Dr. Liu have given a similar classification on ultrasound. And actually, when you talk about grade one, you basically have what is classically called a ground glass appearance with the absence of an alveologram. But as you move towards grade three and four, you get multiple areas of subplural consolidation with atelectasis, which gives you a kind of a snowflake appearance. So, I mean, I would agree that the appearance that Atnafu showed us was like the snowflake appearance, but that terminology should not be used with meconium aspiration. Okay, thank you. I think the problem that we face is uh, very similar to, and I mean, those of you who are, uh, and who've trained in uh, the UK, uh, you'll realize that for some reason, stool, when it's described, is always given something, uh, a terminology like red curry, currant jelly, or, you know, so the British amongst us have tried to, for some reason, describe stool with certain signs that mimic food. And uh, our Chinese colleagues, similarly, for establishing signs in RDS, and it's mainly for pattern recognition. They want consistency with pattern recognition. So they've tried to correlate signs in different lung pathology to give their trainees the ability to recognize that as a pattern. And by giving it an analogy like real life, it, it just becomes easier for them to recognize it better which is why you've got so many signs in lung ultrasound. Uh, so Suman, uh, so uh, Atnafu, are you happy to stop sharing? Suman, are you happy to start sharing and that would interrupt uh, Atnafu's session? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, are you able to hear me? I can hear, hear. So, uh, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Thank you. That's very kind. Someone, would you just like to introduce yourself to everybody? I'd be so grateful. Yes, uh, I am Suman Chaurasia. Um, I am working as a neonatologist uh, at All India Institute of Medical Sciences at Rishikesh uh, in India. Uh, so I was uh, I am a pediatrician by training. Uh, I did my MD pediatrics, then I did my um, there is a senior residency tenure one has to do uh, in India before you become faculty. And after that, uh, I did my PhD uh, uh, in neonatology. Beautiful. That's amazing. After I joined as a faculty here. And uh, for the last three years, uh, I am now in uh, back in clinical uh, domain. Earlier, I did full-time research for uh, some time. And so, yeah, please carry on. And, yeah. Yes. So I have two cases to present. Uh, the first case is uh, a baby who has stayed for quite some time uh, in our 
uh, in ICU. Uh, this baby was initially admitted for respiratory distress, uh, having been born 32 weeks gestation, 1970 grams birth weight, was born through LSCS for fetal distress um, and uh, high drops, RH incompatibility. And uh, we had managed the baby as a case of RH isolation with high drops. He initially required uh, double volume exchange transfusion, actually three transfusions uh, for uh, jaundice. Uh, also required IV uh, IG, uh, immunoglobulins. So I, I, th I think we kind of get the, the tenure that this yes, is yes, a yes. baby who's been ventilated for a long time. Right. And, and uh, you're doing a, a lung ultrasound at 41 days? Yes. And Lovely. I'm using uh, the Sonocyte machine with uh, 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 gen mode and the 9.5 frequency and uh, depth of five centimeters. So this is my... This is the L1. Yep. And um, you see plural, uh, plural, um, sharp and sliding well, well defined. And very um, nice. There are uh, A, A lines towards the lower side, and the upper side, there are some B lines. There are some comet tails as well. Yep. Very and, nice. Uh, moving on. In L2, uh, it is even more clear. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, pleura is sliding sharp um, and mostly A, A lines. These are A profile. The L1, I would say, it, I would also uh, take it as A profile. Yep. And, uh, I agree completely. Uh, L3 this again. Is, uh, L3. Yep. Um, here, uh, towards the upper parts, again, it is uh, uh, a, a line, a uh, uh, lot of A lines. Uh, though I think in the low, uh, I have missed, or there is some probe uh, orientation issue so that the lower side it is just darker. What but frequency again, are you I using guess. at L3, please? This is 9.5. Yeah, you need to drop the frequency a little bit to 8. It's Because this baby is probably about 1.7, 1.8 kilograms now? No, no, no. Uh, smaller than that. Smaller than uh, that. Okay. Yeah, about 1.4. So my only two comments, so just with this image in particular, is that for such a small baby, you wouldn't need five centimeters of depth. I think four would be okay. And because okay. you would be using four centimeters, you'd get a longer footprint. Footprint mm -hmm. means the number of ribs that are visible with a right. larger penetration of sound waves into a smaller space to be visible, which would give right. you a better image. Uh, Actually, on the right side of this image, you can see the deep part, but on the left, right. you can't. So the only other question that I would ask is just jelly on your probe. Is this a linear probe or a hockey stick? This is a linear probe. This is a linear probe. So just, mm -hmm. uh, again, the gel interface, just uh, sometimes when you don't have enough jelly in that uh, top half of the probe and you have more jelly in the bottom half of the probe means you have better contact. And the only okay. reason, again, I raise that is you've got really big acoustic shadows coming through in that mm -hmm. top half. It just gets worse as you move from the from right to left. So again, right. just kind of just ensuring that you've got a decent contact and decent jelly. So can we just go back to your previous image? Yes, actually, I was going to ask you the question that in the previous image, it was showing well. So I suspect you're right. Uh, it was it's so something what, to do with the jelly. Yeah, what happens is when you put the probe on, you, you have right. you put gel on right at the start and you have good interface. And then right. as you move, what happens is the gel gets left in the in the previous area. So again, and this is a really important point as you move is just making sure you have decent gel contact. It's not about the amount. It's having a decent amount of gel between your interfaces. So the reason, again, that I was thinking that was because you kind of have better images. So just if you click on L1, let's have a look at L1. So uh, Anna's asking whether that could be a double lung point. I completely agree. Uh, that is a double lung point. So the upper half of the image yeah. at that point. Uh, the plural looks 
I would say relatively regular. Just when you come to that top half, so the left side, the only thing that I would say is that could also be a consolidation. It's a yeah, deep profile and there's some deep, there, there are some little consolidations, but can you see the deep consolidation in the middle? So if you just come down to the middle half, yeah. there, there, just right. to the left. No, no, yeah, there, yeah, just move laterally, just a little bit lateral. Can you see that coming in and out? That white yes, area. Yes, yes. So that's a deep consolidation. And again, what I'd say right. is that, again, it's to say that, you remember I said you can find double lung points with consolidation with mnemonic kind of presentations. But certainly right. here, I can't see any evidence of uh, a shred sign, <coughs> subcrutal atelectasis. But uh, again, right. it's the upper lobe. So I just be careful. Sometimes you can have a left upper lobe consolidation, which can give you mm -hmm. exactly this appearance. So, right. I mean, nice, nice images. You can make them a little bit more sharp. So mm -hmm. there, the, uh, which machine are you using? Sonosite. Sonosite. I'm 100% sure Sonosite has a sharp mode. So have a look, get your tech in. You must get your tech in because your right, images right. Are, are beautiful, but they're just a little bit blurred and you can definitely get them crisper and sharper just by right. playing a little bit with, uh, it's called dynamics and uh, reflectivity. Mm -hmm. So get 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 your, uh, your tech in if you can. And can you save mm -hmm. these images, please? Because again, for me, the, the the essence of peer review going forwards is I, I I want to see how much we can optimize this image. You can make a good interpretation from this, but let's see. Let's have a look at the right side. Sure. So uh, this is the R one. I have yep. taken multiple R one. Because yep. uh, I yep. thought it, it was uh, not showing properly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. Plural, uh, pluralize here. Uh, it's sharp and well defined. Um, but uh, I, I could not um, get away with uh, this part. I think it's just thymus with some vessel. Absolutely, you've got thymus in there. Don't worry, because you're high up. Whenever you're high right. up, and this is a very important image to get you will often right. get thymus there. Don't worry about it. It just means you've right. got the upper lobe really nicely. And I mean, right. from what I can see again, the right upper lobe, you've, you've got a, an AB profile. You've definitely got B lines there. And you've got right. pleura that's definitely sliding, maybe a little bit of pulse there, possibly right. because of the adjacent vessel. Right, right. But yeah, but, and uh, yeah. yeah, go for it. I, so, um, I was a little confused. This looked to me like... Uh, uh, Consolidation uh, with some uh, red shine over here. Where? Uh, but though, this one, this part over uh, here. But I would just be honest with you. I would right. be wary of interpreting that because I can't see a bat sign. So always just remember mm -hmm. your protocol. You must demonstrate right. a bat sign. You must interpret from the plural line below. Now that could right. be a consolidation, but the reason I can't comment on it is. Above it, I can't see a rib space, and that's thymus. That could be other tissue. That's yes, right. So I would, no. I personally, between you and me, if I'm not doing the scan myself, it would be impossible right. for me to comment on what that means. I agree. That, that's why I said I was a little confused. Yeah, so, that's okay. Don't worry. So let's see right. the rest of your R1. So uh, this is, uh, I slightly oriented to get away with that uh, part. And... Uh, this is what I can see. Uh, the uh, pleura is sliding well, sharp, and uh, there are this is uh, A lines here and bamboo sign. It's beautiful. Uh, I would not uh, be able to do or get a better image, and I have no critique. Uh, You've got the depth. You, thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. But it's I normal. think he, at this point, I probably applied the jelly again. So. Um, because it was R1, so I could get, uh, with the same settings, I could get off. And it might be the jelly that was the problem with the previous images, but this is a yes, beautiful yes. image. I would say that this is perfect. This is perfect. Right. My compliments. Right, right, right. We'll carry on. So this is R2. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, we have good plural, uh, regular plural lines, sharp and sliding well. Um, then there are multiple A lines, again, bamboo sign. Uh, there is some mirror image yeah. also shown. Got a truck sign. Yeah, but good plural yeah, sliding. Well aerated yes. R1, R2. 
सर जी थोड़ा सा गेन बढ़ाए जस्ट लिटिल बिट मोर गेन या श्योर 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 आई मीन मूविंग टू आर थ्री दिस इज आवर ट्रिलर लाइन अगेन शार एंड स्लाइडिंग वेल एंड मल्टीपल ये लाइन्स अगेन बैम्बू साइन हियर I mean, for me, your right lung looks very nicely aerated. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. But I still wanted to look a little bit deeper because yeah. I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have. Frankly, it. speaking, I had some background idea about the baby, so I wanted to see if I'm doing well or if I'm missing. So in the middle you've got a regular pleural line thymus and just adjacent to the thymus you definitely have a, a b profile right. uh, which is what we were seeing previously this is a very nice scan and this is right. the importance of doing the right upper lobe so right. you definitely have a what might be a consolidation there right, right. upper lobe so, is this baby intubated so, ventilated yes yes this yeah. this baby is ventilated where's your tube boss uh i i have an x ray i'll show you okay uh and again when you look at r1 in that zone you've got thymus coming in and you right. definitely have what looks like a consolidation and a deep consolidation there yes. so if you come to this, yeah. Uh, yeah that i i i just you've got i've Is got ribs there the yeah so you might have a a deep consolidation right upper yes. lobe collapse would be the thing right. that i yeah so a, a collapse consolidation the only reason i'd say i yeah. move against atelectasis is you've got pleura with b lines all the way to the top so i mean the lung is aerated but that definitely mm -hmm. looks like a consolidation yeah yeah so uh, earlier aryan aryan was showing not showing this mm -hmm. so uh, because i had some background idea knowledge so i wanted to transfer because uh, where uh, whether i am able to get, capture some pathology so so then uh, this showed consolidation mm -hmm. um and uh, this looks like straight shine over here uh oh uh i no no you no? the question for me is whether that region there and i can't see the bat sign well is whether mm -hmm. you've not got any pleura there and that is atelectasis or thymus either of the two without doing the okay. scan myself it's very difficult to say the reason i'm raising the possibility of it being thymus is i can see a blood vessel in the bottom so if you just come down this one so these these again uh this could be consolidation at the margin of the thymus and you've got an acoustic shadow coming from the rib but there's just a blood mm -hmm. vessel coming at the bottom now that could mm -hmm. be atelectasis or that just could be thymus uh okay. i think my my it, there's definitely no shred sign there but you've lost your pleura at the top for me i mm -hmm. just wonder whether you've got a right upper lobe collapse consolidation and that is either thymus coming into contact with the mm -hmm. consolidation and because you've lost your pleural line so mm -hmm. uh if you come take your cursor mm -hmm. go to the middle middle top pleura okay okay so that entire zone is consolidation b right. profile okay mm -hmm. it becomes deeper consolidation as you move in Now, as you mm -hmm. move up, can you so move up to the pleural line and move left? Left. Now you've lost your pleura here. Okay. You can't see pleura now. For me, that could reflect. Is this the not the effect. pleura? This it line could here? be. It could be. So, but what I'm saying is, you're losing it. I'm not saying it's completely absent. You're losing uh -huh. your pleura there, and that area just below it. That is basically looks like a. A static bronchogram. Come below. Yes, yes. There. Yes, I was going yeah, to ask. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. as you move up, as you move up, mm -hmm. the texture becomes more tissue-like, and this is quite mm -hmm. high. And often, when the thymus comes into contact with that zone, the thymus can also mm -hmm. appear like that. Mm -hmm. So what I'd say is, for me, a right upper lobe can collapse consolidation, probably intermix mm -hmm. thymus because. Can you see? There's a small blood vessel at the bottom. Come right to them. This one? No, no. Further down. Further down. Yeah. Come to the okay. left. Can you see that horizontal line there? 
just to the left my friend to the left okay. there that's a blood vessel okay. so again okay. the the one thing that mm-hmm. i would have definitely done is i would have put a doppler on this please this area mm-hmm. i actually i tried doing that that's in the next slide okay let's but have a look at it put my hand stable <laughs> that is one thing mm. uh-huh. definite visible consolidation yeah right over here yeah to rise like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. definite consolidation and my gut feeling is again it's a slightly better image than the previous one so right. if you go to the plural line go up to the yeah. plural line go to the right right go to the right so regular plural line sliding b profile right one right. big compact b line coming down yes okay oh, and yes. yep and then basically what you've got is you've got rib and you're getting a little bit of a caustic shadow if you come to the middle right. mm-hmm. okay and then you have a comet tail in between right at the top right. go to the plural line right. go to the plural line yeah. now can you see as you move to the left the plural line disappears yes over here now the plural line disappears because there's a lack of aeration there's also mm-hmm. rib shadow coming in which is giving you an acoustic shadow but right. then if you come down there's a deep consolidation can you see that static mm. bronchograms just come down come yeah. down to the middle there there there, there. stop there there mm-hmm. so that is a deep consolidation and then again yeah. you see plural line that comes up with sliding so mm-hmm. do you remember once i told you that you have a what is called a b dash profile where you can't see the pura and again uh-huh. for me the question is whether you've got a right upper lobe collapse consolidation so you've got consolidation mm-hmm. but you've got atelectasis along with it i can't yeah. see thymus in this in this view at all right so okay, i let's... varied the depth here i i uh, used a, a lower depth here just to sure. look like more just in the interest of getting somebody else to be able to present because we need one more person should we just have a quick look at the doppler yeah sure yeah just otherwise yeah we'll be in trouble today but i think i was not able to keep my hand stable and it I, looks it, it, it looks very it. vascular to me you've okay. definitely got some very big vessels there right. uh, what's the crp on this baby this baby had a high crp i think about 64 yeah, yeah but yeah, we yeah. Uh, was it may not be at the same time that i did ultrasound right okay i mean it's like... very vascular so again it would fit more with consolidation if there was complete atelectasis in that region then mm-hmm. you would not have any aeration uh okay. theoretically what i'd say is if you have atelectasis blood flow to that region is also reduced so again that goes in favor of kind of consolidation and a mnemonic mm-hmm. kind of a consolidation but for me what mm-hmm. was important is that region on the right side can you see the region on the go to r1 again on the left r1 on the left no the right. the other image so can you see that region yeah that's where you want to do doppler so you yeah. need to doppler that so, entire region that's right yeah. so as i Because said you, you've doppled the region below it which is a consolidation yeah, yeah. which is why it's giving you that appearance yeah at the outset i did say that uh, and my hand probably was not stable and i, I had moved away so i couldn't get the right place to do the sure. do you have the x ray by any chance uh, sorry for that no it's okay it's very mm-hmm. nice images very nice right so uh, now the curtain raises so consolidation versus collapse this is the x ray classical yeah classical so yeah this baby had so, this uh, so please uh, one small favor please save this yeah. as part of your logbook the image optimization yes, yes. for me uh if we can just go back to the previous image uh so just again i'd say that you can probably get slightly sharper crisper images here mm-hmm. and the way to do that from my perspective is you have to play with uh a little bit of uh, your gain setting and uh, mm-hmm. i mean you're using a siemens you said right no no sona site solar side has got sharp mode you mean if yeah. you get if you you need to get your tech in there is I mean, a sharp mode there yeah so just so 
going forwards, what we'd like to do is we'd like to see mm. image optimization. And in particular, when we start doing the peer review in the consolidation phase, right. it's it just you being able to demonstrate whether we can actually improve. And just for all of you guys, just to be aware, sometimes probes are old and it's difficult and don't kill yourselves over it. But I'm not doing my job if I'm not helping to try and see if we can get this better. But for me, this is a beautiful scan and it's a really good example of you don't need a chest X-ray. And it's also a good example of how thymus can cause problems with confusion because we're going to discuss this in great detail on Thursday and I'm going to get you to find, basically understand when the thymus can be really confusing, especially on that right side. But well done. Okay. Uh, just, I know you've got one more case. Uh, so okay. can we do it next time so that I can get one more sure, person sure. to present today? Not an issue. Uh, 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 yep. Then uh, I'll stop my share. Yes, please. Yep, yep. That'll be really kind. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, so we've had Atnafu, we've had Suman, uh, Dr. Hasun. Guys, I'm going to apologize to the rest of you because we've just got time for one more. Am I audible? Yes, you are. But don't worry. We'll have peer review again on Thursday and again on Sunday. So the people who can't present today will go first that day. And we must keep it to one case, guys. Go for it. Yeah. I, I have one case. Uh, if you were able to keep me there. Uh, yep. Uh, let's. Uh, so once Naz, Shankar, Mayank and Sharif have presented that day, then we should be able to include you for one more case. Uh, so we're trying to keep it to 45 minutes to max 60 minutes. Go for it, Dr. Hazun. Yep. So uh, my screen is, uh, is visual, you know? <laughs> yep. Visible. It is. Okay. So uh, just quickly, is this late preterm, 35 week? LGA and IDM, infant of diabetic mother C-section delivery, uh, admitted in our unit for respiratory distress, get high flow nasal cannula, FIO 2.3, for sure antibiotics started, but our CRP, first CRP was negative, chest X-ray, also TTN versus pneumonia, so we cannot define because there is some area of haziness, not typically for TTN. This ultrasound at 22 hours when the baby started to be more tachypneic. Um, I will start R1, R2, R3, any consequence, uh, in, in, in sequence. So R1. What's it, your machine, Dr. Soon? It's a beautiful machine. It's Siemens. It's yeah, Siemens. It's a beautiful machine, yep. Uh, so R1, uh, we have good pleural uh, sliding. We have a B profile with some small subpleural consolidation. Uh, this is on R1. Uh, R2 also, uh, we got B profile with some A line with uh, pleura also irregular and sub, any small sub, uh, sub plural consolidation. Uh, am I right, Alok? That's correct. Is there yeah. anything else? Okay. I, I know my gain is, is not well because uh, for the deeper area, I didn't see anything. I should, I think, uh, increase my gain setting. So for the deeper uh, areas, you're using a frequency of 12.3. This is a term yes, baby, it, right? Yes, it's term baby. So our it's uh, between 9 and 16 hertz, but Actually, I think it's 12 hertz. Yeah, it's 12.3 that I can see on your screen. Yes. So mm -hmm. again, uh, you've, you've got really sharp images because you've optimized, like you have edge and you have persistence. So just, just because you have a beautiful machine and I can help here. So for a term baby, what I'd say is, uh, is this a preset setting? Yes. Okay. If, you, if you're able to change this preset setting, what I'd say is, what you do is you go into your preset setting, you press the frequency button and yeah. you reduce the frequency. And like I said, for the deeper parts, if your frequency comes down, you'll get much better delineation of your deeper parts because you're missing out on the A-lines that are deeper down. The other thing okay. is your edge enhancement. So you've got an irregular edge under one of the ribs. And uh, again, uh, I probably think it's... It's, it's more your settings as opposed to this yeah. really being debris signed. And what you can do is you can increase edges one. You can put the edge up to what, two or three yeah. okay. to make your plural line sharper and reduce your persistence to two if you can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
And this can be done on the machine or- I can be done on the machine. You can okay. do it on the machine and you can do it in your preset setting just by pressing the buttons. What I'd okay. say is that you leave them in that setting and on, on the next kind of presentation, I'll, I'll show you how I image optimize while I'm doing it in real time. Yep. Oh, okay. But yeah. Cool. But I try, I try to change the hertz. It is in percentage, so it is. Uh, yani it's on eighteen hertz, but when I decrease it, seventy-five, fifty percent. I think it is, yani relatively decreasing by yep. percentage. Yep. Not so fifty percent will give you frequency of nine, which should give you. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. I got it. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. So um, R three, this is R three uh, for sure. This is complete B profile plural. Is the sliding and regular with the. I think this is sub plural or. Dynamic bronchogram. This is my area. I don't uh, subplural consolidation. Here, it's subplural uh, okay. consolidation alveologram. Uh, classical. Uh, right. I, it's not a dynamic bronchogram. No, it's classical uh, compact B lines with irregular pleura uh, and subplural consolidation. Kind of. Yep. Very good. So R four. Uh, also, we have uh, yeah, it's in the pleura here and B profile with some A line and sub some subplural consolidation to the left to the right. Sorry. Uh, here, I think we have uh, R1, L1, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is L1. So here also the complete B profile and sub uh, plural, uh, plural is irregular with some plural, uh, sub plural consolidation. So L1 also, is the image on the left? Yes. So my only question is, it's just you're getting a, a big tissue below with no heart. Are you sure that's L1? I think so, but let me let me go to the other one. Yeah. I just wonder whether it might be L2 because you, I think that's your spleen coming in there. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe it's my mistake, Yanni. That's all right, that's okay. Okay, okay. so if we go to the right, right side and it's yep. supposedly to be, to be our L2, yeah, uh, we have also the same issue. It's a regular plural with B profile and sub plural consolidation. Um, if we look to the L three, uh, also the same. Any yeah, same? Yeah. I agree. I think. I agree. Okay. And L four. If we call L four here, also the same. But what I did in this L four, I go uh, just a little bit posteriorly, and I got this image. Yeah, classical. Yeah. Okay, so this is, I think, consolidation, any yeah, clear, yeah. clear one on consolidation. And when I did the Doppler, it was like quite this. vascular, yeah. Quite vascular. Yeah. For me, so it was consolidation mainly on the left. And uh, when we repeated the CRP, it was 30, it was negative at the beginning, and the baby got intubated. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, this baby was transferred to another for financial issue for another unit. Yeah. So, again, uh, very nice images. Again, very nice use of the Dopplers. Uh, can I just go back to your last slide? Just one comment. <clears throat> so again, if you just click on the images, <clears throat> so you, you, you've got a B profile, you've got compact B lines, and then you've got that A profile on the right side at the top, but we're missing out on the deeper side just because we need to reduce the frequency to get a, a, a better depth. And okay. the advantage of increasing your edge enhancement is you'll get much better visible A lines right to the bottom. So you increase your edge enhancement to maybe two, three, not more than that. I don't think because the risk of increasing it more than that is you exaggerate A lines and just reduce your persistence here to about two. And okay. really what it will do is it will give you image all the way through. But really on Thursday, I will show you exactly how to do it. Because okay. your machine can do it, and we can do it on our machine. Okay, yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you very much. So, thank you. Yep. Uh, do you, you don't have the X-ray by any chance? Do you? Is um, it very ground glass. Oh yes, yeah, this is very it. ground glass. Yeah. yeah, classical. Yeah, uh, GBS pneumonia uh, would be a, a real worry. Worry really long. Yes. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. So yes, uh, Suman, you can increase the depth for this baby can go up to four. I think four would be sufficient. Just remember, four from the front, four from the lateral side, and four from the back gives you eight centimeters. I mean, uh, that's that's a really decent coverage if you're doing images from back to front. So I am very quickly, uh, uh oh, trouble.
just going to open my slideshow. So are my slides visible, folks? Yes. OK. Now, why is today's session very important from my perspective? So the reason why today's session is very important is because what I will be doing tomorrow is I will be sharing with you a guideline. Now, what I have done is over the years, having worked in Southampton and trained with Nadia, I think what was very key for me was that when we take our training forwards, at some stage, we become capable of being able to interpret and to be able to report lung ultrasound. But clearly what happens is when you look at yourself as a department, uh, your ability to be able to do lung ultrasound in the department needs a clear framework. And really, there are important considerations which vary from country to country. Uh, in particular, I think for me, the medical legal implications of implementation, especially where I work currently and in India, where actually ultrasound cannot be reported without uh, having had radiology kind of counter or review those images, uh, is very different to how I would say things are in, say, France, where lung ultrasound is an expected competency of training, and where really from their perspective, the introduction of this diagnostic modality is really done in the baby's best interests and whatever is done in the baby's best interests really can be implemented without having and i'm not saying they don't have governance they do have clear governance they have a very robust and a very very advanced training program which i i think remains to be duplicated even in the best centers in the states as do our canadian colleagues but they can implement it as what i would call is a standard of care uh, whereas for us if you're practicing in the UK, in India, or in other countries, what we're doing is we're learning and we're having to implement this. And really, unless we do it in a structured way, we will struggle. Now, I think a very key aspect of wanting to develop and deliver a guideline is to be able to introduce a new evidence-based diagnostic tool to ensure that we're meeting certain standards when we're performing lung ultrasound on the unit. But in particular, from our perspective, to ensure that we have standards that define our training, who can perform the ultrasound, how it should be reported, and in particular, consistent standards for storage based on your local circumstances, so that if you have to produce or reproduce that lung ultrasound image and that report in, say, uh, uh, a, uh, you know, uh, kind of a medical legal review, you have the capability of being able to do that. And really by having this guideline in place, not only do you protect yourself, but you also protect the patient because it ensures that you're delivering care uh, using a very high diagnostic standard. Now, I think this is supported not just by, I would say what I'm saying, there is proper formal guidance that's now been produced by the American Academy of Pediatrics by Yasser and uh, I would say a group of colleagues who've come together in Canada and the States, which basically says that institutions should have a pathway for institutional credentialing, for identifying consistent criteria to establish who does lung ultrasound, but also to help protect the patient. And this has to be incorporated as part of a guideline that is that is peer reviewed that has been approved by local governance standards, but also takes into account uh, the clinical workflow. So clinical workflow basically means that whilst you're receiving training and you're able to perform lung ultrasound, the question from your perspective is when you perform it, how you take the images, are they of a appropriate quality and standard? And once they are, where are they stored? How are you going to get them to uh, basically be reviewed in relation to the reports? Now, this is quite key. Because if you're performing serial lung ultrasound and you're actually storing or developing uh, kind of different areas where you're storing images, and a good example is in one of the hospitals that I worked in, uh, the QA, when we were doing cranial ultrasounds, images could not be stored on uh, a database. They had to be printed. 
Now, the problem with printing images, obviously, from our perspective, is they have to be kept in paper notes. And really, I'm giving you a simple example that if you review the same paper notes with those images after five years, paper undergoes attrition. So when they're kept in a large set of notes, the quality, the paper, it disintegrates. And actually, if you have to review a scan that far back and you don't have a clinical workflow which can save clips in lung ultrasound, then actually there is a risk, especially if you're trying to demonstrate a pneumothorax. And that then flows into the medical legal consequences of, say, for example, uh, performing, say, an, a needle thoracentesis, and we're going to discuss uh, some of those aspects. So having a guideline is absolutely essential. Now, what should, what should guidelines on lung ultrasound cover? Well, <clears throat> they should be evidence-based. So we should be performing and writing guidelines based on literature and current literature. So, you know, literature should be up to date. But more importantly, what they should cover is the training and implementation standards. So again, what exactly, who, what training should people have as a bare minimum to start doing lung ultrasound? In terms of doing lung ultrasound, uh, how do you differentiate between a trainer versus a person who's currently doing lung ultrasound in practice under supervision? Uh, when does that person who is practicing under supervision become able to do lung ultrasound under indirect supervision with reporting? Uh, how would you peer review those images and when would that person then become capable of doing independent reporting? These need to be defined. Importantly, what you have to define is a standard protocol for performing lung ultrasound with normology based on your machine. Now, this is crucial. Every machine is different. And what I would say is that if you try to image optimize and produce a standard preset setting for uh, your machine, It'll be specific to your machine, but it might differ on other machines. And if you're going out for transport and you start using other machines, and we'll be showing you some images, there, there can be significant differences in how you implement and store uh, you know, images uh, for medical legal purposes, especially if you're moving between institutions. Again, a protocol for defining how you are going to diagnose your pathology in your circumstances. And a simple concept. So, the reason we've tried to induce the concept of profiles is we want you to be speaking the same semantics and the same language. But even with that, there are different ways of describing the, the lung ultrasound in, in different institutions. People don't use the concept of AB profile. Uh, some people do not like using the concept of having an overlap. Uh, uh, as you can clearly see, we use the concept and we, we talk about fractal sign and shred sign. Well, they're the same thing. But then we, we now have debris sign that we learned about with chronic lung disease, which can mimic them. So again, what I'd say is what you really need to do when you're writing your protocol is define very carefully exactly in what context you're using terminology. And a good example is Margarita asked a beautiful question. Should I use the, the terminology snowflake sign? And again, that's where I would say to make guidelines uniform, you need to make sure that you've defined this very accurately. And then what I'd say is you need to have protocolized how you are going to act based on your lung ultrasounds with regards to management. And that is very important because there will be a phase when uh, you feel relatively confident about making management decisions based on how confident you are with the different uh, lung ultrasound kind of based uh, images that you've obtained for a particular pathology. But in the learning phase, a lot of people will want to back that up with x-rays. And then there will be some colleagues in the department, with all due respect, who don't want to learn lung ultrasound, who feel that it's, it's not beneficial because they can make the same diagnosis with an x-ray. And really what I'd say is we're not here to change attitudes. We're not here to force everybody to do what we want. I think what we must understand is there's a spectrum of people who will be practicing in your institution. And your protocols should basically be able to make it comfortable for those people to be able to practice so that they can make and follow a similar approach to your practice, not using lung ultrasound. And I think if you come and try to implement guidelines using that approach, then from our perspective, you are, you are, you are less likely to find resistance. You're more likely to take people along with you. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough how... You know, with any diagnostic modality, uh, people are afraid. A lot of people are afraid. Well, they're afraid because it's 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 a new diagnostic tool. I'd say the the older we get, we become a little bit more, I would say, 
and I think I'm being judgmental here. You know, I, I shouldn't use age as a modality, but I, I'd say that the ability to learn becomes difficult. I certainly find, uh, you know, reading and giving exams quite difficult now at this particular stage. And I, I think that is the challenge. And what I'd say is that by actually taking people along with you and offering them flexibility in how you're able to approach this. And I completely want to endorse that there is a continuum that you can achieve both. And I'm going to show you how. But more importantly, what you've got to agree is standards for when and how you might want to refer to radiology. And a very good example is the case that Atnafu has presented today, where clearly you've seen something that you can't recognize. And really, you're going to need more uh, help. And I think that's the challenge because a lot of pediatric radiology departments, uh, really, from our perspective, are not able to support us because they've not trained in point of care lung ultrasound. But really, they may still be very important in us being able to kind of make an interpretation in terms of what further imaging may be required. I think it's also an opportunity for you to build bridges with your radiology department to kind of say to them, well, folks, what, what about learning with us? Let's, let's try and learn this together. And the advantage with trying to implement guidelines is when you talk to them, they become very interested. And I know at least four participants of our course at this particular point who are closely liaising with their radiology departments while they're trying to implement training that we're getting on this. Again, we've talked about standards for storage reporting and peer review. I think the next most important part is, well, what are the building blocks for producing a good, good robust guideline that's not 33 to 40 pages long? So you could write a book and really, the problem with writing a book at this particular point is it's not going to be useful. I find guidelines that tend to be long and very descriptive uh, tend to, in my mind, fail. Not only do they fail, but actually they become more of kind of a literature review than actually a really important document of how you want to proceed with what you want to do. Now, the most important aspect of them is they need to be unit specific. And we... When I say unit specific, the units who have paperless systems with online transfer of images who can store loops, but there, there are institutions in particular in India where storage of loops will have to be on really on uh, large drives. Uh, the maintenance of those drives and how you keep them and when they get full becomes a real issue. But more importantly, from our perspective, there will be units who cannot store images and have to store still images. And again, the question from our perspective is how then do we medical legally uh, ensure that we're safe while we're doing that. And again, what I'm gonna do today is give you a little bit of a, a framework for how you might want to maintain medical legal safety with a guideline when you're maintaining still images, not loops. Uh, and then a lot of it is the technology. Well, what kind of technology are you using? What kind of probes are you using? Now, there is a very nice article that's been published uh, which basically shows that you can do lung ultrasound in neonatology using any probe. And really, that means that you could use a cardiac probe with a low frequency. But again, if, if you do not have standard probes, what I would write into that is the limitations of the scan and the probe that you're using so that you're making those interpretations. Your guideline clearly acknowledges that if you're using a probe, and say, for example, if my probes are broken and I decide that I'm going to use a cardiac probe today, then really what I would be standardly incorporating into my reporting is the fact that I'm working under the limitations of using a probe, which basically cannot use a frequency of more than nine, which is technically a phase array probe, which is giving me a very small sector. And really the interpretation that I'm making, I am clinically correlating to make that. And really, if that is the case, and I, I have any doubts, I'm gonna actually discuss this with another colleague who has a similar expertise to mine so that we're making the right decision for that baby. And we're justifying that with two experts reviewing those images. So again, technology will, will basically affect that. Now, in terms of the evidence base for lung ultrasound, I'm not gonna do this in a lot of detail, but really when we, we cover training standards, <clears throat> there is a clear classification provided by the Hispanic Working Group around the evidence for us to pursue lung ultrasound. So for those of your colleagues who kind of give you a hard time and say, well, is there an evidence base? Well, there's a very good evidence base with good levels of agreement. And I would say the diagnosis of pneumothorax and needle aspiration, probably when the next guidelines are produced will actually move to class A in terms of the kind of evidence base. I'd also probably say 
that uh, when we talk about the diagnosis of pleural effusions and drainage, again, I think there'll be strong agreement. We'll probably move to A, which will basically be data that's based on uh, very high quality evidence. But the reason I've highlighted points three, six, seven, eight, and nine in yellow, and this is a very important aspect to include in your guideline, is the ISPRI working group, which basically had uh, you know 19 international experts talked about 41 recommendations. And when we look at the recommendations for lung ultrasound, uh, which we've enumerated over here from one to 10, really what they agreed is that for competencies one, two, four, and five, so differentiating RDS, TDN, diagnosing pneumonia, diagnosis of meconium aspiration, viral bronchiolitis, and pulmonary edema, you, you know, from your perspective, you, you kind of uh, really need uh, a level of training that's quite basic. So you could say, for example, uh, if we, we look at the previous guidance, uh, attend a two-day introductory course, uh, do the didactic, uh, didactic education, work on one of the baby work models, which is a simulated model to be able to recognize those patterns, go back to the unit, keep a log, practice for a bit. And really from your perspective, what you'd then be able to do is credential yourself for clinical practice using the clinical workflow for the diagnosis of these conditions based on international recommendations that are evidence-based. But if you're trying to look at lung aeration, decide on LISA for the management of respiratory distress syndrome in neonates. Uh, if you're really trying to detect an accurate uh, or make an accurate diagnosis of pneumothorax and decide that you want to needle or protest in. And similarly for effusions uh, and guiding thoracentesis, really what you need is you need uh, uh, some form of, of advanced training, which means a, in my mind, it's not been defined in the ILCOR guidelines, but probably an element of training under peer supervision, reporting, performing the procedures, and then demonstrating that you're competent to be able to do these. The agreed number on this is, is something that's not yet been decided. And it's interesting, other than the Australian Society of Ultrasound Medicine, which kind of talks about doing 50 lung ultrasounds over a 12 month period, nobody has kind of put their foot down to say, this is the minimum number of scans you need to be to be competent. So we've, we've kind of decided that we will try and define that in our guideline. And the way we've agreed that is that you do didactic training, which could be this online course or a, a course which is uh, face to face, you do hands-on training as part of that course or locally in your unit and have that peer reviewed. Now for the peer review, as I discussed, you're having supervised training or online mentoring or going forwards, you could have a quorum approach where a group of you have been trained and you agree to review each other's images so that in your guideline, you have ongoing quality assurance of your images. Now it is essential from your perspective that you define this in your guideline. If you're not defining this in your guideline, then people, uh, you just risk opening yourself up to uh, people wanting to do lung ultrasound without meeting a certain standard of training, which then from your perspective, and I certainly know that in our, in our work in the, in the Middle East for privileging, we have to demonstrate this. And I will be submitting two TB worth of data when I go for my lung ultrasound privileging over here. So, you know, really, the standards with which you need to meet this have to be agreed based on your local governance framework and should be documented very clearly in the guideline. I've already talked about how we have decided we are going to do that as part of this course. Clearly, all of you have achieved level one for the logbooks that I've seen so far. You're now coming into L2, L3 kind of stages where you're training with a degree of supervision where we're peer reviewing scans. But really the expectation is to achieve level four over 12 months, you should have completed 50 scans with ongoing peer review. And then really from our perspective, uh, what you're really looking to do is then implement this into diagnostic and procedural diagnostic purposes. I'm gonna skip this now and go straight to the fact that from a trainee, you become a practitioner once you really achieve L4 competencies and defining this as part of your guideline is very, very important. More importantly, what you have to do is have standards for what and how you're going to set and obtain image quality. So define your settings, your nobology, 
define your protocols for imaging. And as I've said is we're at this particular point using a 12 region method as opposed to a six region method. Some, some, some of you might want to stick to the six region method in the smaller babies. We've agreed in our guideline that for babies under 1500 grams, we, we use the six region method, but for babies over 1500 grams, we use the 12 region method. And when we use the six region method in babies under 1500 grams, we divide them into upper and lower zones. Now, when you use BRAT score, that's really important because you can do the BRAT score with one, one image in an extremely preterm baby, uh, which is basically the whole of the right anterior region, upper and lower, and then one lateral image. But you'd use three regions to make the score. So again, defining that into your protocol is quite important. But then a really important aspect is defining the normal and the abnormal lung. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because you will have different guidelines on PICU versus guidelines for you. And the way PICU might define a normal lung might be very different to how you want to define a normal lung for a baby that's just been born who's transitioning. And again, I'm giving you a simple analogy that you might have a baby who's just been born who basically has an AV profile. Now for a baby who's got settling respiratory distress with a respiratory rate of 60 with no recession, that is actually normal lung appearance for that baby at about 60 minutes of age. And really what you don't want to do is decide that that's abnormal and decide that you might want to manage that baby with something that is based on PICU standards, which basically says, well, a baby should always have an A profile, which is uh, a smooth pro line, which moves, which is not irregular with a, a complete A lines and absolutely no B lines. We know that we can have up to three B lines. So really, Again, the reason I want you to do this is because you need to define amongst yourselves as a group how you define that. And you might have clinicians who are doing PICU and an ICU. You might be working on a, on a unit which basically has a significant overlap, but you might have babies who are 30 days old versus newborn babies coming back to your unit, inborn and outborn babies. And then you have to define what abnormal is. And a simple example that I'd give you over here is it's defining every pathology that you want to diagnose as part of your guideline. Now, the reason I am talking about this is because I would say that some of you might not want to use lung ultrasound scores to treat RDS. Some of you might agree that you still want to use a clinical and an FIO to cut off for babies between 22 and 32 weeks. And really, lung ultrasound scores are not part of your guideline. Uh, if you, they are part of your guideline, exactly when are you going to do them at what age? Uh, that's really important because if you're doing a lung ultrasound at two hours of age and another person's doing it at four hours of age, then actually what you're doing is you're not having consistency in, in your approach to management of different babies and different babies will get managed in different ways. But again, a simple example that I would give you is C profiles. Now, a C profile could be consolidation. It could be atelectasis. It could be pneumonia. And really, you have to establish how you as a group are going to differentiate this for consistency, because the way you might treat a collapsed consolidation because the tube is down the right main bronchus may be very different if you think that baby also has shred sign and you pull the tube back and that collapsed consolidation is persisting and there's a history of prolonged rupture of membranes when that, that could then be a congenital pneumonia. So really you need to define those very carefully in your guideline, but more importantly, you need to define storage and reporting. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you're reporting in different ways, uh, you will end up with different diagnostic uh, kind of considerations. But more importantly, if you're doing serial lung ultrasound, you will end up with different interpretations and you'll end up with different interpretations because you're using different probes. So actually standardizing your reporting, this should all be part of your guideline. So I'm gonna take just two minutes to invite questions before we go on to the most, most important aspect. So any questions, guys? No questions? Okay, so just before I start this, what I'm gonna say is that I would be very grateful if all of you can transfer your logbooks and your images from the participants file to your own personal file. If any of you has not got that, then please, from my perspective, can you come back to me? because I would then like you to delete the folders from the lung ultrasound participants folder, which I've renamed today to resources library. Now, the reason for that is as of tomorrow, I will be populating that with 
a guideline. So we've done some groundwork for you. So we share, I'll share with you two, uh, two approaches to the guideline that you can have so that you can actually start producing your own local guidelines. Uh, you can use that template if you want to. Uh, you can change it. You can plagiarize it. You can do whatever you want with it. I have absolutely no problems, but it's literature reviewed. But what I'll also be doing is we'll be sharing with you an extensive library of articles and in particular articles based on which uh, the, the, uh, the guidelines are based, including some updated articles that have recently been published. So the nomenclature for reporting in the lung ultrasound forms are all there as part of the chapters. So, when, so if you go to the chapter on reporting, there's a, there's a, a downloadable uh, folder, which has got every, it's got seven different types of lung ultrasound forms. But for me, the nomenclature for reporting is also there. So you can download it from that. Now, this is the most important aspect of your guideline. And really what you need to be able to have is an approach to defining how you are going to approach lung ultrasound in your unit while you are learning and while you are training. Now, the assumption from my perspective is that when you have, <clears throat> and some of you have basically finished the course, you'll be very comfortable doing lung ultrasound. I think the majority of you will be very comfortable doing lung ultrasound to make certain diagnosis. Now, those diagnoses will be based on, I would say, presenting clinical syndromes. So the term baby with a respiratory distress at birth, and there are people who are doing lung ultrasound in the delivery suite. The term baby with respiratory distress at a few hours of age who's admitted to the neonatal unit. So the postnatal baby who has respiratory distress. The preterm baby, 22 to 32 weeks, they'll all be admitted. Well, the question from your perspective is, how are you going to standardize your approach to the protocol that you currently use? Or how are you going to incorporate this into guidance which uses FIO2 thresholds and clinical thresholds as cutoffs for giving surfactant? And then you have syndromes like acute collapse on the ventilator. So how are you going to incorporate lung ultrasound into a baby who's deteriorating slowly? How are you going to use the, the SAFE and the safer R protocol? And uh, really, we're going to talk about that again because the safer R protocol, as I discussed in the previous meeting, it's quite crucial that from my perspective, you implement it based on clinical presentation. And we'll talk more about that. So a simple example that I'll give you is a, a baby who does not have any signs of respiratory distress, but who's becoming gradually shocked with rising lactates, uh, is showing signs of hypotension, could have a tension pneumothorax or could have cardiac tamponade. Now, really, you can make the diagnosis very quickly. On the other hand, you might have a presentation of UVC extravasation with the SAFER R protocol, which presents in a slightly different way. Now, the SAFER R protocol gives you a diagnostic algorithm that asks you to go through certain steps, which is beautiful. But my only worry about it is actually, it, that may take a long time for you to come to a diagnosis in a baby who's rapidly deteriorating. A better approach is actually to look at the clinical presentation of the baby. Now, if you've got a tense distended abdomen that's shining with actual lipid leaking through your UVC, in a baby that's profoundly hyponatremic, who's actually not showing significant signs of rise in FiO2 and respiratory problems, uh, but has shock because uh, you're really struggling with inability to manage an extreme preterm. My feeling is the probe might actually go onto the abdomen first as opposed to going onto the lungs and the heart. So just a little bit about that, but just coming back to this, what I'd say is that based on your clinical presentation, you will become relatively comfortable making a diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome, TTN, differentiating, making a diagnosis of pneumothorax, pneumonia, pleural effusion, these common kind of conditions. And you will then decide that you want to make a management decision based on them. Now, how do you transition from, well, do I need an X-ray to help me to confirm to, well, I'm relatively confident and I know I don't need an X-ray because I've achieved a level of competency that's based not just on evidence, but it's based on the fact that I have this many images. I, I have got evidence that I've stored. I've done a log of images. I'm privileged and I've got those privileges acknowledged by institutional credentialing. Well, in the learning phase, while you're doing them, one of the ways to consolidate is just get a chest X-ray. And uh, a simple example is if you've got a baby who say, for example, is hydropic, and you decide that you are going to tap that uh, pleural effusion. Now, for me, if that baby is stable in delivery suite and is saturating, I will actually 
manage the respiratory side of things, bring the baby to the neonatal unit and basically perform a lung ultrasound to look at the deepest pockets of fluid. But more importantly, which side is worse? Is it the left or the right side? Uh, now, if the baby is reasonably stable, I don't think it's unreasonable to confirm to your position with an x-ray if I've intubated him, see what it looks like. But I will always do a lung ultrasound to confirm my largest pocket before I go in. Now, that's just an example where I'm using both modalities in a baby that's relatively stable to give me the best clinical approach to giving and performing a management uh, strategy that I think is going to make this baby better. On the other hand, if I've got a tension pneumothorax in a baby and an x-ray is going to take 30 minutes, really in that situation, I'm not just going to use my lung ultrasound. I'm going to clinically correlate. I don't know of a tension pneumothorax in my clinical opinion where pulses are weak and you have a baby who's deteriorating where I would wait for a chest x-ray before I put and do a needle thoracentesis. I might transluminate very quickly, make the lights dark. And in my clinical experience, you know, I would say you make the diagnosis clinically the majority of the times and a lung ultrasound can only help that process. But if you've got to wait for an x-ray to do it, by that time, the baby might get very sick. So really, when you clinically act in that situation, I'm just asking you all a question. For those of you who are anxious about doing this based on your lung ultrasound, well, if you didn't have a lung ultrasound, would you really wait for the x-ray? You probably wouldn't. You'd go clinically, you'd transluminate, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd look clinically and you'd needle. So if you can do that with needle, lung ultrasound is only going to help that diagnosis. But more importantly, I would say that You've, if you two colleagues trained in lung ultrasound and you can review and it's permissible, that's actually two people verifying your diagnosis that makes and gives you even more confidence that you're making the correct diagnosis. If time permits, if time permits and the baby is stable, get a chest x-ray. And then you've got an additional modality that is helping you while you're in the learning phase, the transitional phase of learning and becoming more confident with lung ultrasound to be able to aid your diagnostic process for making these common diagnoses. At the end of the day, peer review. So once you've written into your guideline that you are deciding to make diagnosis and management strategies based on lung ultrasound with or without chest X-ray, having a quorum meeting once a month, which basically reviews lung ultrasounds that you are performing with a group of individuals, and then putting in a final report, which endorses what you're doing, basically, again, provides you with a lot of confidence. My experience of having done this in Southampton with two other colleagues over an 18-month period was we almost always came to the same conclusion 90% of the time. I think what we realized was we could improve our image quality. We could improve our diagnostic kind of uh, interpretation based on improving image quality. But in terms of making a wrong diagnosis, I don't think we've ever come to that conclusion with all of us doing lung ultrasounds and peer reviewing each other's images. So again, the mental modeling here is key, but can you see how I'm taking you through a process that helps you ensure that if, if you know, reduce the medical legal implications of using lung ultrasound in the neonatal unit. And when this is defined and incorporated in your guideline and has gone through a governance in a peer review process, that is the gold standard. And doing that from my perspective, is, is the approach that you should be following. My, my experience would say that once three months are over, you've done all the lectures, I would actually say for the remaining three months while we're doing through consolidation, all of you should work on trying to produce an evidence-based lung ultrasound guideline in your unit. Uh, in terms of a diagnostic algorithm, I mean, this is just an algorithm that's been produced by Dr. Kuripa, which basically gives you an approach to making all the common diagnosis that we've identified over here. And the lung ultrasound guidance that I, I basically wrote in Southampton, we were not going to use lung ultrasound scores to diagnose RDS. I think the consensus from our perspective was that would be a step too far in terms of our current practice. But in terms of being able to make common diagnosis, we've defined that into our guideline. And we've basically agreed certain standard terminologies based on this algorithm to basically be able to make lung ultrasound diagnosis. You can define different protocols. And again, this is just an example of the blue protocol and the false protocol. But again, defining how you might want to apply them in neonates will differ. And this is really important. If you're adapting such protocols to neonates, really, I'm, I'm just going to give you a simple example that you can find all these conditions in neonates, but the clinical conditions which actually lead to these problems might be very different. 
So finding a PE in a neonate is very rare. And I think, again, really what you've got to do is if you're using and you're wanting to adapt these protocols to your, your local standards and your local clinical diagnosis, you need to probably have an element of peer review. We'll talk about the safe and the safer R protocol, but I would like to end, first of all, by going through a case to try and emphasize why a guideline is so important. Now, uh, who, who wants to have a go, guys? Anybody, any volunteers? Okay, I can go. Is that Anna? Yes. Okay, Anna, you put yourself to the sword then. Okay, so this is a 34 week baby who's CPAP. Uh, the background history is this baby basically was delivered by elective cesarean section. Uh, the reason being this was a breech delivery with a mother who they had, they had significant concerns the pelvis was small. Uh, they decided that uh, version was going to be ineffective because of that. So the mother had an elective cesarean. The baby was born grunting, did not need any resuscitation at birth. Uh, Mum was not in labor because it was elective cesarean. No risk factors for sepsis. It was a cold section. Uh, the reason they, they went for an early section of 34 weeks is because they were worried that if the mother goes into early labor, there's a risk they might Far, head might become too far engaged and you know might be difficult this mother lives very far away from her nearest hospital uh, the baby basically from our perspective uh, was reviewed at birth was seen by uh, a uh, a resident who agreed that he'd like to review the baby again at two hours and at two hours of age this baby was still grunting significantly so was admitted to the neonatal unit and currently this baby uh, is on CPAP in about 40 percent oxygen uh, peep of seven uh, is uh, about three hours of age. Uh, the gas is a pH of 7.2. The PCO2 is 59. The base excess is minus six. You've got a lactate of 3.4. This is a venous gas. Baby started antibiotics. Do you want any more history? Well, for now, I, I think it's okay. So um, I'm showing you just the right side. You can assume yes. the left side has been done. And the left okay. side basically shows uh, a classical AB profile with double lung points, L1, L2, L3. And in L4, uh, you've got a B profile as you move to the back with a, a dominant B profile, smooth pleura on the left side, compact B lines, no subpleural consolidations. This is the right side. Okay, on the right upper, I think we can see the pleura is sharp. And uh, for me, it is sliding on the right of the scan, but not on the left. It seems okay. a long point. Okay. Um, now it's uh, the image that is frozen. Yeah, so I'll just play it again. Okay. Okay, what do we think about that left side? So I'm just gonna use my pointer. The left side, the left side. So can you see my pointer? Oh, yes. What do we think? Yes. So no pleural sliding? Yes, I think okay. there is no pleural sliding there. But is there an A profile a there? Do we think that's A lines? Or do we think that's a consolidation? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, a lines. Okay. Uh, I think it, the angular pointer is a uh, line. Okay, great. So, what do you think about? Do you think there's a truck sign there? Maybe yes. yes. We can yeah. see the the mirror image of the rib. Okay. So you have a truck sign over there. You've got. I agree. Pure is not sliding, and uh, so. Clearly, this is Dr. Sharma in his young days when he was not so good with scanning, and he probably still is learning, but uh, he's not demonstrated very nice A-lines. So there's a little bit of confusion. So what would you like to do next? M-mode. Okay, so let's do M-mode. What do we think? I 
think it's a seashore sign on right. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you can see a barcode on the left. So very good. So it's you can't see a barcode here because can you see the cursor is actually in the region of the it's, portion it's showing lungs right of the lung. Yeah. yeah. So again, suspicious. Now my question at this particular point is you've got this, and if I said to you, there's a barcode sign over here. I'm just curious with a show of hands, guys, all of you, all of you have to give me an answer. This is a baby in 40% oxygen with a, a gas like that. So how many of you want to think of a needle thoracentesis at this stage based on this image? And how many of you want to do a chest x-ray? So I want an answer from everybody, please. Chat box. If this is only on the right upper, it seems more. I do R3 to see if it's more extended. Okay. Okay, so it is more extended. You do R3. So this is this is the M mode on. So what do you think about this M mode? Let's assume this is R3. This is not R1. So. Okay. This is a barcode. No. Okay. Very it's good. Not easy. I completely agree. It's not easy. And that's why I'm showing you this case. Because really, first of all, let's see what the chat box says. I thought so. Everybody's going to do a chest x ray. Everybody. None of you brave. Come on, guys. Everybody is safe. Everybody is safe. That's a crucial thing. So discretion is the better part of valor. Safe is important. So I think that's perfectly reasonable. So clearly, let's say we're in this situation. So again, would you like to describe this, Anna? <laughs> the, the left scan? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a, we're all sliding on the right of the scan. Yeah. Now it's frozen. With the, some B lines or comet tails that we, I yep. think we can see the um, death um, to the death parts of the world. Okay. On the left, uh, I see an nylon. Okay, so I'm just giving everybody an analogy now. I'm saying to you that this baby has gone into 90% oxygen. He's not saturating. His sats have dropped to 50, 60%. The right side transluminates clearly. And this is the second person who's done this lung ultrasound. So two people have confirmed and both of them agree that this is a barcode sign. Now, how many of you are going to wait for the chest X-ray and how many of you would like to put a needle in? The baby still has a heart rate of 140, but saturating. So let's let's go into the chat box. Anna, what would needle. you like to do? Okay, you want to do a needle? To, to needle. To yeah. Needle. Okay, so let's see. how many. Anybody want to do a chest X-ray? If it takes too long. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you, you want to say something? Maybe else? without the lung, maybe, maybe without the lung ultrasound, we do that if the x ray doesn't come uh, sooner. Yeah. So, so, with that lung ultrasound, I would not have doubt. Yeah. So, what I'd say to you is that this is why clinical correlation is so important. Now, medical legally, let's say, somebody decided to needle this, you'd still get a small amount of air out. The baby would get better. But clearly from your perspective, I mean, you've got a small anterior air leak at this particular point. But I'm, I'm just saying to you that uh, you're kind of in a situation where this baby doesn't need to be needled clinically with the first scenario. So you're not going to needle the baby, you're going to give it time. But you know there's an omothorax that could get worse. So what I'd say to you is that if you're confused all you do, and this is all I've done, 
is I've asked a colleague because I'm not getting such good images here. And in particular, if you see, it's the right anterior zone. And really what I'm not getting is I'm not getting good depth at three and a half centimeters uh, because I need to drop my frequency. I'm also not getting good A-lines. So I basically call another colleague who basically decides that actually what he's going to do is he's going to drop the frequency. And can you see how better the A-lines are? So two colleagues, and this is what I'd like you to kind of think of. Look, while you're learning and you're doing things like this, as you gain more confidence, if two of you can do it, well and good. If it's one of you who's doing it, uh, really clinically correlate, but you're keeping yourself safe by actually using your clinical correlation. And think about what you would do in real life. So if you didn't have lung ultrasound, lung ultrasound is just being used as a diagnostic adjunct over here. But for the latter scenario, I don't think anybody would wait for a chest X-ray. You'd kneel. And uh, technically, I, I, I've been in a situation where we've had bilateral pneumothoraces. They're very difficult to diagnose if you have bilateral tension pneumothoraces, where we've empirically needled in that situation. We've got air from both sides. So really, what I'd like to reassure you about is that if you clinically correlate and you make a diagnostic decision based on that, and you can get another person to confirm that, and you decide to act and you peer review these images, then really you're only going to come to one conclusion in the first scenario, which is get a chest X-ray or wait and watch, nothing to be done. I think the only thing that I would do is if the gas was reasonable, I might decide to reduce PEEP go on to optiflow to reduce peep trapping. So I might make a diagnostic change based on that. But the other way is, and this is just the example of the images side to side. Can you see the difference? So you've got a seashore sign and you've got what is a barcode sign. Barcode. And it's subtle. I'm at the lung point, which is why it's subtle. If I take my, my cursor, so if I take my cursor, and I move it here, I'll get a better barcode sign, but I'm just at the margin here. So I'm getting a barcode sign in this region and you can see a, a nice sandy beach over here. Any questions about that? <clears throat> May I do a question? Yeah. Um, so Sorry, we've lost you. Sorry, was that Margarita? Margarita, we've lost you. Yeah. Uh, just while Margarita's coming back to us, uh, Sujit, you have a question. Go for it. Yeah. Hi. Look, you know, with uh, so with the uh, with the barcode sign, mm -hmm. the, the cursor. Where exactly do you do you put it at the lung point or do you put it where no, there is no? no, no. I I will get. I will basically put the cursor. This is at the lung point. Yeah, I would put it at the margin, which is most obvious to me. So what, what, again, what I'm trying to do is anterior air, the baby's anterior. So I'm going to put my, 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 my probe there, do the M mode there, save it. And then I'm just moving laterally across. When I find the lung point, save it. And really what you should be able to see is the transition from the seashore to the barcode sign, which is really what you're seeing here. So I can't get these images side to side but I'm gradually transitioning from the seashore to a barcode sign. And if I had the cursor further in this region over here, it would be more obvious. Mm, okay. And that's, that's how you basically quantify uh, a nomothorax. You know, if, if you kind of have R1 going right up to R4, that's a pretty large air leak. Now, just really important guys, tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis you do not define tension pneumothoraces on X-ray or lung ultrasound. So if you have problems with weak pulses, you're not saturating and you're bradycardic, that is a tension pneumothorax. If that's what you think clinically, you transluminate, there's reduced air entry. So it is not a diagnosis that you make on a chest X-ray and lung ultrasound. So people look at the size of the, the pneumothorax and you know the pulses are fine and this baby's saturating and just looking at the size, they kind of say, oh, that's a tension pneumothorax. Actually, what I'd say is that it's it's a clinical diagnosis. And that's the reason why you would clinically needle or put a chest strain in after a needling once you've made a cl clinical diagnosis of a tension pneumothorax if the baby is you know deteriorating. You wouldn't wait for either of these two modalities. But if time permits, an ultrasound is available on the unit. I mean, I can do it in literally if 
a few minutes boot the scanner up and i mean this 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 scan basically took me 2 minutes to finish while i'm waiting for somebody to run across my radiographer to come in uh, get the ultrasound the, the 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 chest x-ray machine from the the chest x-ray room you know it'll take me 30 minutes in southampton to get an x-ray uh, any other questions Look, I have a question about the logbook, but uh, I don't want to jump to another topic, so I'm happy to wait until the end. Okay, so can I just share, while any other questions, I because I just want to share the guideline that we've produced with you. Uh, hello, can yeah. I come in? Yeah, please. C can you show the image once again? Which one? Uh, the slide. Okay, just a uh, sec. Can you see the slideshow? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah. My question is about uh, the, uh, the the rightmost end here. Um, it looks like some uh, AIS like picture. Just a query. This bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's liver. Okay. It's diaphragm. That's liver. Uh, okay, it's covering entire this. Yeah. Okay, shooting. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just and uh, what about the uh, pleura at the end? Just trying. Yeah. Just because I'm not getting alignment, because I'm not okay. aligned, so you're not seeing this region very well. So, again. Right. Yeah, just that bit. Of course. Yeah, that's. Okay. I'm getting dropout. Can you see a rib shadow? Yeah. 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 I mean. I wouldn't comment on a pneumothorax here because I'm just not uh -huh. well aligned. I need to right. I need to demonstrate this better. And again, so uh, slightly towards uh, the left. Uh, sorry, uh, can you go back to the same? Yeah, uh, no, not uh, in the same area you were there, and now slightly towards the left. Slightly, a little bit more. Here, uh, this uh, we can see this transverse A line. Um, typically, uh, it starts disappearing with B lines. So, is, is it an A line only? This is an A line. Can you see my cursor? Right. So, this concept that B lines always cause A lines to disappear is not correct. Mm -hmm. You will not get B lines when you have a pneumothorax. Right. But when you have an AB profile, depending on the amount of interstitial fluid, you can have visible A-lines. Okay. So the concept that you will, when you have B profile and B-lines, never get A-lines, that, that is not correct. So that is an A-line that you see there. And it's just okay. not very well visualized because my image quality is not great. Okay. But Thank actually, you. you know, once you come here, it's much better visualized you see a lines all the way again i'm using a high frequency so i'm missing out on the depth here but in the next class we will show you how to improve that but again if you see this i mean this is classically a barcode sign that you see over here okay. and that's the lung point so guys any other questions before i quickly just take you through any other questions no You already answered my question. So okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do just before I sign off is basically show you what we've done and how we produce a generic lung ultrasound guideline. Can you see this? Yes. 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 So basically, what I'll be doing is sharing this with you. Now, this basically gives you one approach to how you can produce a lung ultrasound guideline. And what it basically does is it's, it's meant to be brief. I'm not interested in making it long. But the idea is it starts with A, the definitions, how we want to perform lung ultrasound, standard definitions, what protocol we're going to use, the findings, and how we define those findings as per our protocol in our unit, who performs lung ultrasound, how it's reported, what are the training requirements, and how we are going to implement them. And then basically, 
details everything else in the appendix. Now, for those of you who are keen and who are interested, and in particular, if you're keen to try and sign off with an L3 competency, what I would say is I would be very keen for you to develop lung ultrasound guidelines based on the literature and share them with us. And let's see what you come up with because we can all learn from each other. But more importantly, what I'd say is that the reason I have discussed the last case with you is I'm just saying to you that if you have a standardized approach to how you're going to approach a pathology when you see it in terms of waiting for a chest X-ray of time permits versus treating that, incorporated in your guideline, which is what we've done in this guideline, then it allows a phase of transition while you're learning. But more importantly, it provides a very robust framework for those people who don't know how to do lung ultrasound to treat that condition with uniform practice. And that just means that it's more accepted. So that's it. I'm going to sign off. Uh, I apologize, guys. We've overrun again, despite my best efforts. Uh, just for the next session, guys, five participants, one scan each, keep the history brief. And I, I think the cases that we saw today were amazing. I think Suman's case was absolutely amazing. I really liked it. But thank you all. God bless you. And next time we're doing pneumonia collapse consolidation at Lictesis. Have a good evening. Sorry, Alok, can I quickly yeah, yeah, ask a yeah, question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, please. Can I quickly share my screen to ask you something about the logbook? It will yes. take 30 seconds. Yeah, 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 no problems. Do you mind stop sharing your screen? Oh, I, I, I apologize. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so these are the boxes, like uh, uh, my folder is here. You asked us to delete some of these folders, but this is my, my folder, I kept it in, yeah. in that box. Yeah. Is that all right? So what I'm gonna do, Dr. Sharif is, the problem is this box has a maximum capacity of two GB, which I think you'll run out of very quickly. Yeah. So now if I just share my screen, yeah, I stopped sharing. Okay. For all of you who are on, so you can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, on my screen, in my Dropbox, I have created individual folders for you that you can synchronize with your Dropbox. Do you have unlimited storage? Can you see the screen? Yep. Not yet. Okay. Yes, One yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. we can. Yes. Okay. So really, the, the folder that you currently, some of you have got uh, your logbooks and everything in is this folder, which is called Lung Ultrasound Library. Sharif, I've shared this with you. Maybe I've used the wrong email, but I'll share it with you again. But really, okay. what I'd like you to do is take all of these out and go and save them in your personalized logbook. This means that you will not be able to see anybody else's logbook, but it also means nobody can delete your folder. So this is your personalized logbook as it is at the moment. Okay. Uh, so you want me to take because I can't I can't reach here. Um, like on my on my logbook, I can uh, when I yeah I can see all of this. Okay. So I'll do it for you, and I will share this with you. And don't worry, okay. it's all backed up. So. That's done. Okay, so if I need to update my logbook, like adding some... So I will share a link with you right now. I will share that logbook with you. Okay. So that you can, and just WhatsApp me back personally and say that it's working. All right. And okay. once it's working, I will delete your folder from the Lung Ultrasound participants. But in this folder, which is now called Lung Ultrasound Library, you will find the guideline. So there'll be a folder with the guideline. Uh, and really you'll find a, a folder with library that Anjali will be putting up on Friday, which has basically got the references for all the chapters that are allowed to share with you, that we're allowed to share with you under Creative Commons distribution copyright. Some I can't, 
but the the ones that we can so you can actually log in and read the articles on that but that'll happen on friday uh, just one last piece of homework that is really important guys uh, so for me over the next 3 months uh, again there'll be lots of peer review sessions but really once we finish the lectures the peer review sessions that we do will be done using the form that i emailed you in the last email uh and you can save that uh again i will be writing in that will be putting comments in and uh, i'll sign that off uh i would aim that in the three months of peer review after the sessions are complete we can at least use that for five of your scans each and that will be formative assessment as my aunt discussed in addition to the summative assessment that you'll do at the end of three months if you're not maintaining a logbook you're losing out and at the end of 6 months i will not i will not be able to carry on peer review uh you have an extra 3 months at the end of that uh to give the test but after 6 months i'll have to stop guys reason being we'll be moving on to the next module so please make the most of this thank you very much god bless you all and i'm grateful for your stamina god bless you thank you thank you thank you thank you Thank you.